23-year-old Lily Aramburo was a beautiful, sweet, and kind woman whose life had been a quest to find the beauty in nature and within herself. While Lily was fiercely independent, as she aged, she found herself falling into the grips of drug addiction and was diagnosed with several mental health issues. She had dropped out of high school at 16 and fallen deep into a world of partying and drugs, but it wasn't a glamorous life. She had left home and taken to living in abandoned buildings, crashing on friends' couches, and for a period of time, she even lived out of the back of a Toyota. Lily's mother was constantly on the lookout for her daughter, wanting to bring her home and help her sober up. But Lily was independent, and while she would call to check in, she only returned to the family home for those short periods during which time she needed a break from her hard and fast lifestyle. As she got older, those breaks became fewer and further between. It seemed as if Lily would be forever lost to this world, but suddenly, everything changed. In January of 2006, Lily discovered that she was pregnant. The realization that she was going to be a mother awakened something in her that she had suppressed for so long. Now being responsible for another life and wanting to provide all that she could for her unborn child, Lily left her boyfriend, kicked her habit, and began putting her life back together. She went out for and received her GED. She began taking classes in Buddhism and looking for new ways to feel fulfilled that didn't need to come out of the end of a needle. Shortly after the birth of her son, an old friend, Christian Pacheco, shows up and confesses his feelings for her. Lily, lonely and wanting a secure family for her son, returns his feelings. Unfortunately, Christian was still using, and soon, Lily fell back into the habit of shooting heroin and smoking crack. The drugs, combined with now living together, lead to a volatile situation. Several times police are called for a domestic dispute. On one instance, the police place a call to child services who take Lily's son into custody. Lily was ordered to complete rehab in order to regain custody of her son. In late May, Lily failed a mandatory drug test and was ejected from rehab. Christian picked her up, and rather than taking her straight home, he stops at a crack house first. Within 48 hours, Lily vanishes. After spending her evening with Christian, their mutual friend Kelly, and another man known as EJ, Christian claimed that Lily had walked out of the condo at 2 a.m., wearing only a nightgown and carrying two bungee cords. She had left her money, phone, and personal items behind. Christian alleges that he assumed she was going out to blow off steam, though he would later suggest she may have been suicidal. Christian waits 24 hours before filing a missing persons report. He doesn't tell Lily's mother for days. His SUV vanishes within weeks of her disappearance, and he's later accused of paying off witnesses. Over the course of the next several years, Lily's case becomes a chaotic confusion. Witnesses lie about sightings and then later recant. Christian takes a polygraph test and the Miami-Dade police release incorrect results. The media ignores the story and the police, for the most part, are too busy or too disinterested to commit much time or effort. Lily's mother, and her best friend Janet become the champions of her case, and it's entirely due to their efforts that any word gets out at all. In what has to be one of the most ignored and worst investigated disappearances, the questions remain. What happened to Lily Aramburo? Did she simply walk out into the night and vanish of her own volition? Could she truly have been suicidal? 
and elected to end her life that night? Did she make contact at a crack house with a known killer who may have taken her life? Or does Lily's fiancé know exactly what became of her and spun a yarn about her walking out as a cover-up for murder? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 41, The Vanishing of Lily Aramburo. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today's episode examines the mysterious disappearance of 23-year-old Lily Aramburo from the Miami area in 2007. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and missing persons. Trace Evidence is available across all platforms and can be found on iTunes, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, YouTube, and many more. Further information, including full episodes, transcripts, merchandise, social media links, YouTube videos, and much more, can be found on the website at trace-evidence.com. Trace Evidence has a Patreon for those of you who wish to support the podcast. Patrons receive shout-outs, stickers, ad-free episodes, and special updates. This podcast is a complete one-man operation, so if you wish to help, please check out the Patreon page at patreon.com slash trace evidence. Donations can also be made via PayPal for those of you who wish to help but don't want to use Patreon. There is a PayPal donation button on the website. If you'd like to contact me, You can email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Find me on Twitter at traceevpod. That's T-R-A-C-E-E-V-P-O-D. Add me on Instagram at traceevidencepod or join the Trace Evidence discussion group on Facebook simply by searching for Trace Evidence or clicking the direct link on the website. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. As a final note, if you enjoy the show, please rate and review it on whatever app or platform you're listening on. The more ratings and reviews the show gets, the easier it becomes to find the podcast, and the more attention can be given to the cases that I cover. Today's episode examines the disappearance of Lily Aramburo, who allegedly walked out of the condo she was sharing with her fiancé and was never seen again. It's a heartbreaking story, made only more frustrating by a lack of investigation, a media blackout, and false information being released to the public. As a final note, Lily's fiancé's name is Christian Pacheco, and despite sharing a last name, I wanted to make it clear that I am in no way related to him. This is episode 41, The Vanishing, of Lily Aramburo. Lucelli Aramburo was born on November 16, 1983, in San Francisco, California. She's referred to by friends and family as Lily, and in order to avoid confusion in this episode, I will refer to her the same way, since Lucelli and her mother share the same first legal name. Shortly after her birth, Lily's parents made the cross-country move from California to Florida, settling near Miami. Lily's father left soon after the move and filed for divorce. Though the reasoning has never been made clear, it seems apparent that Lily's father wanted nothing to do with his family. According to Lily's mother, all contact was severed between them. When asked about Lily's father in an interview, Lucelli stated, quote, He's never had any communication with Lily since we divorced. End quote. Lily was Lucelli's pride and joy, a beautiful baby girl with thick brown hair and brown almond eyes that could make the subtle transition to hazel from time to time. Of her daughter, 
Lucelli would say, quote, Lily represented everything that I knew that was good to me and always wanted. She represented happiness to me, end quote. It was a difficult challenge for Lucelli, raising a daughter all on her own. Frequently, she supported them by selling flowers at busy intersections and performing various odd jobs. She was dedicated to her daughter and as a result, went to any length she deemed necessary to ensure that Lily was raised in a supportive and loving environment. Knowing that the abandonment by her father could bring Lily pain later in life, Lucelli did all she could do to ensure that her daughter never felt unloved or wanting. As a result of this, mother and daughter moved around, but stayed in the Miami area. Lily was described by friends and family as a deeply caring and sweet young girl. Her personality was magnetic, and her compassion was all-encompassing. And as a result of that, in combination with her beaming smile and tremendous sense of humor, Lily had an easy time developing and maintaining many friendships. Her social circle began growing at a young age, and while Lily had a good number of friends, she was also introspective and sensitive. Lily loved nature and would spend as much time as she could outside. She especially loved flowers and trees and thoroughly enjoyed watching wildlife. Lily's love of flowers, perhaps inherited from her mother, would stay throughout her life. She felt a special kinship with them and one of her favorite activities was picking flowers. When life got to be too much or Lily simply needed some time to herself, she would often wander off and find a field or meadow where she could spend hours just admiring the scenery, gathering flowers, and feeling at one with the beauty of the environment she so adored. Lucelli wrote a few words about her daughter for this episode, and her statement reads as follows, quote, She would play with ants, making their work easy, and helping them by cleaning their path. She developed an interest in nature very young, plants and especially flowers. She would stop and see how pretty they were and acknowledge the difference between them just like a butterfly would admire every detail on them. She was always playful and she took life simple, but also in a deep way. Growing up, she also expressed herself in an artistic way by wearing unique outfits put together in a unique way and she started to make jewelry. She cooked tacos and would take them to her friends, wearing her version of her Mexican heritage proud. In a hippie way, she always had a lot of appreciation for me and my work, which is hard at times. I'm a florist. No wonder why she picked me as her mother. To describe Lily is to describe a butterfly, free, fragile, and colorful. Her spirit is free and happy, fragile because the world was too harsh for her to understand how it was not all in harmony like she would like to experience it. Colorful because no matter what, she always brought smiles to the people around her with her great sense of humor and quick wit in a childish way. She was pure in feelings and ferocious when it came to injustice. She will always be on the side of the people she felt were disadvantaged, full of compassion and the will to help others. Hanging around her always made me feel better and wanting to be better. Her kind heart was delicate and she can see everyone's pain at times and it would be overwhelming for her when she was a little girl. Her pure, loving spirit will always be present to remind us to stop and see for just a moment and appreciate life. A moment that can be gone so fast, but Lily lives on in our hearts and the beauty around us. We will never forget her sweet smile." End quote. Lily would attend Shenandoah Elementary Riviera Day School in Coral Gables, the home of the University of Miami. She would go on to attend Ponce de Leon Middle School. She was a good student, not necessarily rising to the top of her class, but her grades were good 
and she very much enjoyed spending her time learning. Each year that passed led to Lily's circle of friends evolving more and more, and as she began blossoming into a teenager, her interests would grow as well. She took an interest in music, falling in love with classic rock. She could often be found listening to bands such as The Beatles and The Doors, getting lost in their timeless rhythms. Lily was an avid reader and often found herself digging into biographies about musicians and other figures that caught her interest. She translated her passion for the written word into her own channel of emotional expression, keeping a journal from a very young age. Things would shift for Lucelli and Lily in the summer of 1997. Mother and daughter moved north from Miami to Hollywood, Florida. Lucelli opened a flower shop located on Sterling Road, and while she had hoped that this would provide her with a better ability to raise her daughter and an opportunity for a better life, Lily wasn't pleased with the choice. Lily was 14, and it was a difficult transition for her, as any major move is for a teenager. She had established strong friendships and bonds during her first 14 years, and now she was in a new city with the need to start all over. The move from Miami-Dade County to Broward County wasn't sitting well with her, and she tried to maintain her connections to her Miami-based friends. The kids Lily met in Broward County were less free-spirited and more restrained by their parents, and while she wasn't a troublemaker, she had gotten used to a less constrained lifestyle. Lily began attending Hollywood Hills High School, and for the first time, began being difficult and stepping outside the rules. Lucelli has suggested that the absence of a strong father figure in the home may have contributed to Lily's tendency to push the limits, and her disinterest in making friends in her new home wasn't making things any easier. In a later interview, Lucelli stated, quote, She didn't have her father around. She didn't want to be in Broward because all of her friends were in Miami, and those kids didn't really have any parental supervision, so it was easy for them to start using drugs, end quote. While it wasn't necessarily out of the ordinary for a teenager in high school to experiment with alcohol, Lily began earlier than most and wasn't simply limited to drinking. Lucelli, when asked about Lily at this time, responded, quote, The crowd she was hanging out with were having a lot of fun, but also there started to be a little too much fun, so they were a little bit out of control. I'm sure there was a lot of alcohol involved a lot of partying, possibly pot, at that time." End quote. Indeed, Lily had begun smoking marijuana with her friends, and around this same time, she was diagnosed with depression. Lucelli recalled the school psychologist calling her and telling her that Lily had a chemical imbalance. By the time Lily was 16, the combination of her depression and drug use was having a dramatic impact on not only her grades and school attendance, but also her personality. She started bucking the system, breaking the rules, and staying out past her curfew. When Lucelli tried to rein in her daughter, hoping that it was just a rebellious phase that teenagers often go through, Lily began taking things to a larger extreme. Her experimentation with drugs had also grown to a dangerous level, where she had begun trying harder substances, such as ecstasy, ketamine, and cocaine. Lucelli was struggling to keep her in control, trying to protect her from the dangerous situations she was entering. But Lily's independence was too strong, and before long, she stopped coming home at all. Lucelli would later say, quote, She'd go hang out with her friends from Coconut Grove. She would sleep in the streets, in a park, at the beach, I'd go looking for her in all these places until I would find her." End quote. Frustrated with the rules and with the behavior expected of her, and more driven to have fun and spend her days partying with friends, Lily dropped out of high school. For the next several years of her life, 
Lily lived a transient existence, sometimes home with her mother, sometimes out on the streets. Kelly Starling, a friend of Lily's who had known her since middle school, explained, quote, We enjoyed just being out on the streets, doing whatever we wanted to do. Lily was the closest girlfriend I ever had. At one point, me and her were living in a Toyota, end quote. During this time in her life, Lily stayed away from home and kept herself high on whatever was available, only returning home for those brief periods during which she didn't mind being sober. While it was a partying lifestyle, it was clear that Lily was struggling. Drugs had taken a hold of her, and though she willingly submitted to their influence and indulged frequently, friends could also see a desire in her to break from the wild lifestyle. In a tragic twist of irony, the girl who had wanted so desperately to be a free spirit, unshackled by the rules of any system, was now bound to one of addiction. The impact on Lucelli was painful and difficult, which she explained by saying, quote, It was very tough for me. I was a nervous wreck. I couldn't concentrate on my business. End quote. The relationship between the two became strained, But Lucelli loved her daughter desperately and wanted more than anything to bring her home and keep her safe. But Lily at that time was beyond her reach. Lily and Kelly continued their hard partying ways, finding friends' houses to crash at when they were worn out. One of these friends was a former Marine named Christian Pacheco, who developed a friendship with both. Though he had been drug-free previously, he began using with his new friends. He will transition in and out of Lily's life for the next few years, but will become important later. On those nights when a friend wasn't available, or Lily and Kelly had worn out their welcome, the two would often squat in abandoned buildings and vacant houses, and if none were available, they'd walk down to the beach and sleep on the sand. Though Lily was living essentially as a homeless woman with a taste for whatever drug she could get her hands on, she managed to maintain contact with Lucelli for the most part. She wouldn't go more than a few days without calling home and letting her mom know that she was all right. And for Lucelli, these calls were both comforting and heartbreaking. When Lily was 20 years old in 2003, the phone calls would stop when she met a man David Lamasso, who would not only become her boyfriend, but who would introduce her to a drug which would take a hold of her life like nothing ever had before. Heroin. Concerned friends eventually told Lucelli that Lily had been shooting up. Very worried, Lucelli tried to locate her daughter but was unable to. At this time, Lily went a month without calling home and Lucelli knew things had gotten bad. She began hunting for Lily, searching everywhere. She combed the beaches and exhaustively searched Peacock Park. For two days she had been looking and could find no sign of her daughter, until one morning when she was driving past a bus stop and saw something that stood out to her. According to Lucelli, quote, I saw some rocks and I saw a little head and I just recognized my daughter's hair, and I stopped, and sure enough, that was her. She didn't look good. She looked very, very weak, and I just went to her, and it broke my heart, and I'd never seen her so skinny and so bad in all my life." End quote. At the time Lily was found, she was propped up against David Lamasso, who was also strung out and in no condition to help. Desperate to help save her daughter's life and break her free of her addictions, Lucelli funded a stint in rehab. However, Lily quickly decided that it wasn't for her, and after only a week, she broke out and went running back to her boyfriend and her heroine. Their relationship had become more about their mutual addictions and the ready supply of drugs, and they spent most of their time strung out or looking for their next fix. The struggle inside Lily was still raging, though. While she was physically drawn to the high, her mind knew that this wasn't the life she wanted to live, 
and she was desperate to straighten out and sober up, but she couldn't resist her urges. In 2004, Lamasso and Lily began using crack in addition to heroin, and this caused a shift in Lily's personality. The sweet and kind woman who still lingered beneath the face and behavior of her addiction began to fade. She became more aggressive, and as Lucelli states, quote, I noticed she became angrier, more irritable, end quote. During this time, Lily was diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. According to Lucelli, Lily was experiencing paranoia and suffering from hallucinations. It should be noted that some sources have claimed that Lily did not receive these diagnoses until later. For the next two years, Lily would sway back and forth between sobriety and intoxication. She would go through periods during which time she managed to stay clean, but she always fell back into the cycle of addiction. It wasn't easy to break free when almost everyone you've ever considered a friend has drugs at the ready. It would require a dramatic change, and for Lily, that came in January of 2006, when she learned that she was pregnant with David Lamasso's child. The pregnancy had a miraculous effect, seeming to shake Lily from her drug-induced haze, and for the first time, her eyes opened. With the help of her newly found good friend, Janet Forte, Lily stepped away from the drug world, left David Lamasso, and began to change her life. Of this time in her life, Lucelli would say, quote, She definitely wanted to stop the use of drugs, and she wanted to change her life, knowing there was another person coming, and she was responsible for it. End quote. Janet described this time as an awakening for Lily, saying, quote, She was surprised. She wasn't expecting that. She was very happy. She changed completely. She was very positive. She started taking care of things in her life that had been neglected in the past, so it was a very happy time for her. End quote. During this time, Lily committed to Buddhism courses and simultaneously pursued and earned her GED. Things were beginning to look up. Lily was turning her life around, and she was excited by the proposition of being a mother. She and Lamasso didn't stay in contact, and he eventually moved to Puerto Rico, where he began pursuing life as a Buddhist monk. For Lamasso's mother, it was a blessing, saying, quote, their relationship was never a healthy one, end quote. For Lucelli, it was a moment of relief and joy. She had her daughter back, and in September of 2006, Lily gave birth to a son she named Paulden, an event which Lucelli described as the happiest moment in Lily's life. According to everyone who knew Lily at that time, she was completely and hopelessly in love with her son. She rarely if ever put him down. Of their bond, Janet stated, quote, She was nurturing, very loving. She was always holding him, always carrying him and hugging him. End quote. Shortly after the birth of Paulden, Christian Pacheco, who Lily had met during the days when she was sleeping in cars and abandoned homes with Kelly, resurfaced. He had heard about her split up with Lamasso, and according to him, had been harboring feelings for Lily for a long time. At this particular point in her life, Lily was very excited about her newborn son, and feeling very optimistic and positive, though there was a certain lurking sadness. Despite the blessing of her son, Lily couldn't help but feel slightly lonely, that longing for a partner to share this life with, someone to love her as limitlessly as she loved Paulden. Christian began making advances, telling her about his interest and trying to win her over. He provided her with support and friendship when she needed it, but he'd always wanted more. Lucelli later said, quote, I believe, after birth, she felt a little too lonely, and Christian was always pursuing her, telling her that he would always be there, and offering all these things for her, 
that security and comfort, end quote. Christian, when asked about his pursuit of Lily, explained it simply, stating, quote, I told her, you know, I've always been in love with you. I've always loved you. And she's like, I love you. I've always had those feelings for you, end quote. In late 2006, shortly after Paulden's birth, Lily had moved into a trailer which Lucelli had helped set her up in. While she had her own place and a newborn son, there was something missing, and the more Christian approached her, the more open Lily became. At the time, Christian was living in a condo and also owned a second home. He was doing well in business and reportedly drove a Cadillac Escalade as well as a motorcycle. While business was rising, personally things weren't as put together. Christian was still struggling with drug addiction. Despite his struggle, he was kind to Lily and seemed financially secure, and so when he propositioned her with the idea of moving in, she was hesitant at first, but eventually agreed. Christian has explained that he very much cared for Lily and Paulden, and felt that they made for a loving unit. He was excited by the proposition, and four months after Paulden's birth, in January of 2007, Lily moved in with Christian and the two became engaged. The romance was developing quickly, but there were also issues between the two that were beginning to rise to the surface. The two had discussed the possibility of moving to Arizona after getting married, and in early February, Lucelli watched Paulden while the couple took a trip out west to look at the area and see how they felt about a possible move. This was also around the time that Lucelli began to notice their problems, and she witnessed a few separate arguments. Lucelli didn't necessarily think the problems were major, and attributed them to the typical issues that can arise when two people move in together. In a later interview, she stated, quote, I could just tell she wasn't all that happy. It was just she wasn't open. She wouldn't tell me what was going on. I thought they were probably having a little bit of adjusting problems and stuff." End quote. Friends of Lily's who were close to the situation have alleged that Christian was not only using drugs at the time, but was using them as a way to coax Lily into staying with him. They have speculated that Christian at that time was trying to get Lily back on crack and heroin, whether it was so that she would party with him or so that she'd feel dependent on him, was never directly stated. Though an exact date can't be known for sure, sometime between February and March of 2007, Lily began using crack again. Lucelli described her daughter as vulnerable at this time, and felt that that vulnerability was preyed upon. Lucelli became aware that something was wrong, and she began to suspect that Lily was using again, According to her, Lily and Christian were partying late into the night and constantly having people over. Lily would frequently ask her mother to watch Paulden in order for them to party without having to be concerned. Kelly Starling, Lily's old friend, was crashing with the couple and became witness to several disputes that continued to escalate in terms of violence. About their confrontations, Kelly said, quote, Lily is one of those people who can sit there and poke you until you just snap. Christian didn't know how to control his temper. After he did drugs, he would just blow." End quote. She later recalled a situation in which Lily made a comment about the possibility of leaving Christian for another man, and according to Kelly, Christian lunged at her and shook her, and Kelly had to remind him that there was no reason to do that and essentially had to pull Christian off of Lily. On February 19th, police responded to a 911 call from Christian in regard to an argument that was occurring. According to their report, at the time police arrived, both individuals were calm. Police spoke to them separately, but neither was interested in having the other removed from the home or in pressing any charges. The situation appeared to be diffused, and Christian told the officers that he would sleep on the couch that night, and he apologized for the inconvenience. 
Things were worse the next time police came, which was on March 23rd. Two officers arrived after a call about a dispute and found the condo in disarray. The incident report describes the condo as having, quote, broken glass, old food, garbage, and dead insects scattered throughout the home, end quote. There has been a report that Lily complained about abuse at the hands of Christian during this interaction, but I've not been able to find anything which verifies this. There are rumors that Christian knew one of the officers and was able to keep this detail out of the report, though that is debated and unconfirmed. What is in the report is that Lily told the officer she was struggling with several medical conditions and her medication wasn't working. She was taken to Jackson South, a public hospital located in South Miami-Dade. In the meantime, a call was placed to the Florida Department of Children and Families. The DCF took six-month-old Paulden into their custody, reporting that the couple was, quote, in no condition to currently care for him, end quote. Lily was told by the court that she would not be able to regain custody of her son unless she was able to successfully complete drug rehab. In April, Lily checked into St. Luke's Addiction Recovery Center in Liberty City, where she would stay until May 29th. It should be noted that I have seen reports that her stint in recovery lasted only two weeks, while others have listed her as having been in rehab for a month. Either way, Lily's exit from rehab is not by her own choice. The court had mandated random drug testing, and Lily failed a test, which resulted in her expulsion from the rehab center. Lily was adamant that the test had to be wrong, but the judge wasn't having any of her argument. According to Christian, Lily called him to pick her up, though I've seen reports that he was already at court with her that day. But according to Christian, she explained that she had been kicked out of rehab. At this same time, Lucelli was granted custody of Paulden, but there was a court order which restricted Lily from seeing or being around her son, and so when Lily exited rehab, she couldn't go and see her mother. Instead, Christian took Lily to a crack house in Coconut Grove and made a purchase. They then headed back to his condo and got high. A former neighbor of the couple, Alicia Garcia, ran into Lily on May 31st in the condo parking lot. According to a statement she made to a reporter, Lily wasn't doing well. She said, quote, She was really down on herself. She complained that everyone in Christian's apartment was smoking crack, and she blamed him for making her smoke too. That was the last time I saw her. End quote. Lily will vanish just over 24 hours after this interaction. There has been an unconfirmed report that on or around the day Lily left rehab, she made a phone call to a friend. According to this report, Lily was allegedly crying hysterically and begging her friend to pick her up because she claimed to be in fear for her life. Allegedly, Lily makes the statement that Christian told her that he could make her disappear and no one would ever find her body. This story is supposedly also told to Lily's mother, by Lily herself, and she goes on to say that she had woken up in the morning, finding bloody needle marks on her arm, and she's worried that she was either getting dosed while asleep, or was dosed after passing out, and that someone may have been trying to give her an overdose. While this is a very compelling account, it has never been officially confirmed. Whereas many believe this is a high possibility, others have argued that both Christian and Lily were experiencing paranoia due to their drug use, and Lily was suffering from schizophrenia, among other mental health issues, which may have contributed to this. Lily and Christian were home at the condo. Later in the day, Kelly arrived along with a man referred to as EJ, later identified by Kelly as Emmanuel de Jesus. The foursome begins smoking crack and using various other substances in the living room. According to Christian, at some point, Kelly got up and went into his and Lily's bedroom 
and this caused an argument between the two. Christian stated, quote, I guess it was too noisy out in the living room for her, so she went into the bedroom to lay down. Lily and I were talking, and she got upset that Kelly went into the bedroom, and she was like, you want to be with Kelly now, end quote. Christian says at this point, he went to the bedroom and asked Kelly to come out, telling her that he and Lily were going to need their bed alone that night, and they didn't want her in the room. According to Christian, when he returns to the living room, Lily is walking out the front door. She's wearing only a nightgown, nothing else, not even shoes. She takes none of her personal effects with her, though, according to Christian, she's carrying two bungee cords. Lily, now 23 years old, exits the condo at approximately 2 a.m. on the morning of June 1st and is never seen again. It should be noted that reports vary, whereas sometimes it is stated that Christian saw Lily walk out of the house. Other times it is said that when he returned from the bedroom, she was already gone, and EJ told him she had left. According to the latter account, Christian notices the bungee cords are missing and assumes Lily has taken them with her. The bungee cords were supposedly from a bike rack that Christian had. At the time, he didn't think much of her exit. He later said that he thought she was just taking a walk or possibly going to pick flowers, which she often did when she was upset. He has said he assumed she would return, stating, quote, She left her phone there. She left her purse there. She left everything at my house. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would she leave everything? If she was going to leave, why wouldn't she at least take her phone with her or something? End quote. At this point, Christian doesn't pursue Lily. He allegedly falls asleep and awakens in the morning to find that Lily still isn't home. According to him, he isn't greatly concerned until the day begins turning into night. According to Christian, he drives around looking for her and supposedly even visits the crack house in Coconut Grove where they had scored drugs previously, thinking that she had gone there to get high. According to Christian, it was a very bad environment and he was worried she may have ended up there. He described the house as, quote, guys pimping out their girlfriends or forcing their girlfriends to have intercourse with people for drugs. Standard crack house. The floors were tore up. The walls were tore up. There was no toilet, no running water. There was no refrigerator. There was no electricity. End quote. According to him, Lily is not at the crack house. He doesn't report Lily missing until the evening after she disappears, on June 2nd, more than 36 hours later. And when he did, he told a disturbing story to the officers responding to the call. According to the police report, Christian gave a description of Lily and expressed a concern that she may be suicidal. He told officers that she had previously attempted to commit suicide at the condo According to his story, Lily had gone into his closet and used one of his ties to hang herself from the bar on which his clothes were hung. In a later interview, he stated, quote, She was just really drunk and tried to hang herself in my closet. I broke the pole down, put her on the bed. She was still frantic, still crying. Finally, I was able to calm her down, end quote. Interestingly, the details of this story will change over the course of time, but investigators in that moment had no reason to doubt them. There is some debate about how long Christian waited to notify Lucelli that her daughter was missing, with some reports showing it as being two to three days, and others saying it was closer to five days. When he does tell Lucelli, he does this over the phone. Lucelli later explained, quote, I'm sleeping, and I got this phone call from Christian telling me that Lily walked out of the house and that she hasn't come back and that he filed a missing persons report, end quote. She in turn called Janet Forte, explaining that Lily was missing and that Christian had filed a missing persons report. 
Janet and Lucelli got together and paid a visit to Christian to find out exactly what happened. He told them the same story he had told police, but for Janet and Lucelli, the suicide aspect didn't connect with them. Lucelli later said, quote, killing herself, not even in a moment like that, that it was so bad. She wouldn't have done it, end quote. Janet didn't buy the story that Lily simply walked away either, believing there was more to this story, but Christian wasn't sharing. The case was assigned to Detective Aaron Mancha of the Miami-Dade Police, who was on vacation at the time. Why the case was assigned to a detective who was on vacation cannot be known for sure, but as a result, the case sat on Detective Mancha's desk for a week before he returned and began his investigation. It should also be noted that it took over a month for an official missing persons flyers to be drawn up. Police began by conducting a search in the area surrounding the condo and speaking to friends and family. They find nothing which indicates foul play, nor any information that leads them to anything about Lily's possible whereabouts. Almost from the beginning, Lucelli and Janet felt there was a disinterest from the Miami-Dade Police Department. They felt that Lily's case wasn't considered a priority and that she'd been written off as just another drug addict who had disappeared. According to them, Detective Mancha told them directly that Lily was a drug addict and if she wanted to disappear, it was her choice to do so. Later, when reached for comment, Captain Jana Bollinger Heller, the head of the Domestic Crimes Bureau for the Miami-Dade Police, pointed out that they receive a monthly average of 400 to 600 missing persons reports. In 2007 alone, they received a total of over 5,000 missing persons reports, many of whom had been found. According to Bollinger Heller, 90% of the cases are closed within the first year, and she further stated, quote, We are talking about runaways to elderly folks who walk away from a nursing home and with adults, they can go missing on purpose, too." End quote. Bollinger Heller points out that they only have four detectives handling missing persons cases, and is insistent that Lily is a high priority, but they have many other cases to handle as well. Whether or not the police had a lack of interest, a shortage of manpower, or too many other cases to investigate can't be known for sure. But regardless, the bulk of the searching for Lily is conducted by her mother and Janet. A few weeks after Lily went missing, with no new information and no sightings, Lucelli takes to driving around every day, looking in various places she believes Lily could possibly be. She has flyers printed up, bearing photos and giving a physical description, along with the last time Lily was seen. Lucelli later said, quote, I got in the car and started looking in some of the areas that I thought she could possibly be. I was very scared, in a way, but I knew I had to do that, so I did, and I ended up being in the worst places ever, horrible crack houses, end quote. Despite her efforts, no information comes in, and while she feels that law enforcement isn't interested, She's also frustrated to discover that the media has no interest in covering the case either. There are no articles written, no reports given. By all accounts, Lily's case was widely ignored. Many have assumed this had to do with Lily's history of drug abuse and Christian's statements about a suicide attempt. There are others that feel that Lily is ignored due to the prevalence of missing white woman syndrome and with her being of Hispanic descent, rather than a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Caucasian, the media doesn't see ratings in her story. It's a frustrating time for Lucelli and Janet, who feel the entire case relies on them. They continue the search, using every spare moment they have. Right when desperation was beginning to settle in, and Lucelli was feeling that she was never going to find Lily, she got a surprising phone call that reinvigorated her. Christian called, and according to Lucelli, he told her that some mutual friends had spotted Lily. She was seen in downtown Miami, and the two men, Elvis and Dario, 
allegedly reported to Christian that they had spoken to her and were sure it was in fact Lily. Lucelli was skeptical and wanted to speak with the men, and she did speak with one of them who confirmed the story. There doesn't appear to be a direct confirmation of which man she spoke to, but according to him, he was certain it was Lily and he swore to Lucelli that he had seen and spoken with her. This sparked Lucelli and Janet to begin searching Miami more closely, and according to Janet, they combed the entire city. She later said, quote, Her mom and I went out looking for Lily. We went all over town, up and down, all over town. End quote. While this sighting had given them a moment of hope, it was quickly washed away when nothing else came to the surface. It did make Lucelli believe that Lily was still alive and out there somewhere, but with each passing day it became harder to cling to that hope. From the beginning, Lucelli and Janet found it nearly impossible to believe that Lily would just run off. Yes, she had disappeared in the past for periods of time, and she was using once again, but things were different now. She had a son who meant the world to her, and in no way could they comprehend her willfully choosing to walk out on him. After two months of fruitless searching, they couldn't help but feel that something was wrong with the situation, and their suspicion of Christian began to grow. They had several questions which they felt Christian had never answered to their satisfaction. Firstly, they wanted to know why he'd waited so long to file the missing persons report, or to contact Lucelli. Christian's response about the report was concise, saying, quote, I called the police earlier, but they said you couldn't file a missing persons report until 24 to 48 hours, unless it's a minor. Should I have filed the report Sunday morning? Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't thinking about that. I was worried about where she was. I wanted to find her." End quote. In reference to not calling Lucelli, he simply said, quote, At one point, I thought Kelly talked to Lily's mom, or somebody talked to Lily's mom. End quote. It should be noted at this point that while Kelly has spoken positively of Lily, in the very few conversations that members of the media have had about this case, in her personal life, she doesn't always appear to be so kind. Janet described their relationship as somewhat back and forth. While it was stated by Christian that Lily accused him of wanting Kelly, which he denied, a photo did appear on Kelly's MySpace page after Lily's disappearance, which depicted herself and Christian in somewhat of an embrace. Perhaps it was just innocent. Prior to Lily's disappearance, Kelly made an angry post about her on her MySpace page. It does contain some harsh language, but for the sake of accuracy, I will quote directly. The post reads, in part, quote, She only thinks about herself, dude. She's seriously a shell of a person, a fucking crackhead, a manipulative, psychotic little monster and she's so fucking paranoid about losing her drug supply that she's turned on me for fear that I'll steal Chris from her because he and I were such close friends before she even started really hanging out with him." End quote. For many, comments such as this have made them speculate as to whether or not there was, in fact, something going on between Christian and Kelly, which shines a suspicious light on that final night at the condo. Lucelli and Janet decided to pay an unannounced visit to Christian's condo. They wanted further clarification. They wanted to find out exactly what happened the night Lily disappeared, and they wanted him to answer some questions. According to Janet, Christian didn't behave like someone who was upset or hurting over the disappearance. She stated, quote, His behavior was very strange, and he wouldn't look at us. He would be talking, but he was cleaning his house at the time. It sticks out a lot because he didn't act like a concerned boyfriend or fiance." End quote. Christian has argued that, at the time, he was absolutely devastated by Lily's disappearance, and his behavior could be chalked up to the fact that he had dramatically increased his drug use in some form of self-medication. He said, quote, I just wanted to dull the pain of her being gone. 
I was feeling abandoned. End quote. Shortly after their visit, Lucelli and Janet went to see the Miami Dade police and told them of their suspicions. Nothing came of this, and the two continued their search. By September of 2008, a little over a year after Lily had vanished, the case had grown cold and little to nothing had been discovered. Lily remained missing and there were no new leads, no new information, and no one seemed to really care. At least that's how Lucelli felt about it. Janet decided that their best option was to reach out through the internet, and so she created a Facebook page entitled Help Find Lily Aramburo. She also made a blog and began using Twitter to spread the word. The push on social media finally yielded some results. Francisco Alvarado, a journalist for the Miami New Times, took an interest in the case and wrote a comprehensive article in which he spoke to police, Lucelli, Janet, Kelly, and Christian himself. The article happened to come across the desks of two private investigators, Joe Carrillo and Anna Lanuza. The investigators were moved by the story and contacted Lucelli, offering their services pro bono. Carrillo felt that this was a case that needed to be looked at, and he, too, felt that authorities likely hadn't given it the attention it deserved. He later said, quote, We took on the case because Lily Aramburo is a mother and somebody's daughter, and she's lost and needs to be found. End quote. Interestingly, shortly after the private investigators took the case, the article began spreading around. The Miami-Dade police moved back into action and brought Christian down to be interviewed. During the interview, Christian was asked if he was willing to submit to a polygraph test, which he did. The family, along with the private investigators, were informed that Christian passed his polygraph. For Carrillo, this was enough to take his focus off the man as a possible suspect, stating, quote, If you pass a polygraph, that goes pretty far in eliminating you from being a person of interest from us or law enforcement. End quote. Since Christian was ruled out, Carrillo went to the next two people who had most recently seen Lily, Kelly and EJ, who had been present at the condo the night she vanished. According to the investigator, they questioned both of them and asked of any possible places that Lily may have gone. They were told about the crack house in Coconut Grove. The investigators went to the home hoping to find information. They kept an eye on the place and eventually got in touch with the owner who gave them the names of some of the individuals who were living there. One of these names stood out on a background check. It was revealed that he had a prior conviction for second degree murder. For Carrillo, this made him a likely suspect and he began to develop a theory that Lily may have returned to the crack house that night and been the victim of a violent crime. Carrillo also discovered that this suspect was out on bond at the time, but as a private investigator, he didn't have the authority to forcibly bring the man in for questioning. He took all of his information on the case and brought it to the Miami-Dade police, who went to the crack house and did some investigating, but nothing much came of it and they quickly moved on to other things. Carrillo was frustrated, feeling like there was a possibility that they weren't being given due attention. In an interview, he stated, quote, It's hard to speculate what could have happened in that house. All I know, as an investigator, is that she had frequented that house before and there was a person in that house that had killed somebody before. End quote. Once again, the case began to fade, growing colder. At some point, there's an alleged anonymous tip called into the Miami-Dade police. According to this call, supposedly from a friend of Christian's who wishes to remain anonymous, Lily had been murdered and her body is located at an abandoned property. For whatever reason, police did not conduct a search of this property until a month after the call is received. Two separate search and rescue teams volunteered to conduct the search early on, but authorities did not allow this to happen. When the police did finally search the property, they report finding nothing, 
Though Janet and Lucelli still want the search and rescue teams to give it their own examination, as they no longer trust the Miami-Dade police to properly investigate this case. For the next two years, the case remains on a shelf. Leads fail to develop, Carrillo finds himself in a corner with nowhere to go, and Lucelli's frustration with the lack of attention given to her daughter's case rises to the breaking point. In November of 2009, in hopes of drawing in attention, she stages a hunger strike along with Janet. For a week, the two women sit in downtown Miami, refusing to eat while holding signs, handing out flyers, and trying to push for some focus on Lily's case. The response they get is from predominantly Spanish-speaking news organizations who run a few stories on Lily, but this fails to stir up any new information. Another year would pass. By December of 2010, Lily had been missing for three and a half years. It was at this time that Miami-Dade homicide detective Ray Hoadley learns about the case and takes an interest. He approaches his bosses and requests permission to look into the case, and they agree. For the first time since Lily went missing, a detective is determined to figure out what happened. For Janet, Detective Hoadley's interest and dedication provided a dramatic shift, not only in the case, but in her own perception. She stated, quote, From the moment I met him, I knew things were going to get better for the investigation, and it was the first time in three years that I felt positive, and just, he changed my whole view of the police department, this man, end quote. Detective Hoadley's first step was to examine the case file. He takes extensive notes on all the information present, but during his examination, he begins to question multiple things. First and foremost, almost all of the statements present in the file are unverified. They were simply recorded at the time, but there was no investigation to prove or disprove the statements of people who were present in the condo that night namely Christian, Kelly, and EJ. In addition to this, Hoadley has problems with the story in general. The idea that Lily simply walked out doesn't fit for him, and he later says, quote, It just seemed very unusual that a female would walk out of an apartment at two in the morning wearing only a nightgown without any money, without any credit cards, without a phone, when all of that was available to her at the apartment she left from. End quote. Then, Hoadley makes a shocking discovery. As he is nearing the end of his review, Detective Hoadley comes across the polygraph test that was given to Christian two years prior in 2008. While the Miami-Dade police had informed Lucelli, Janet, and private investigator Joe Carrillo that Christian had passed, the test results contradict that. According to the polygraph test, when asked the question, do you know what happened to Lily, the test showed that Christian was deceptive in his response. According to Hoadley, Christian failed that polygraph test. He immediately informed the family and asked his bosses how it was possible that this man could fail, but the information was released that he had passed. All that could be said was that it must have been an error in communication. That error resulted in an additional two years passing, during which time Christian was ruled out as a suspect, when all the while, he should have been being looked at more closely. Sadly, this is not the first surprise Hoadley finds. In his attempts to verify original witness statements, Hoadley tracks down the two men who had reported seeing Lily in downtown Miami a few weeks after her disappearance. Elvis and Dario. When asked to confirm the sighting, Dario makes the statement that he is positive that he never saw Lily. Elvis agrees, saying that he did not see Lily either. When asked why they told Lucelli that they had seen her, Elvis alleges that Christian contacted him and asked him to tell Lucelli this story, saying that it would make her feel better and cause her to not worry so much. He further alleges that Christian offered him drugs in exchange for his false statement. Christian is asked about this, 
and responds, quote, I told nobody to say they ever saw Lily because if you saw Lily, I wanted you to come with your own merit and for it to be true, a factual thing. And for reasons beyond my comprehension, he said that I told him to say that he'd seen Lily and there's no way that is possible, end quote. Hoadley kicks up the pace of the investigation and during the week of Christmas, 2010, he brings in search teams to assist in looking at the condo as well as the area surrounding it. The team consists of officers as well as canine units and cadaver dogs. They utilize a helicopter to photograph and document the area, looking for any places someone may conceal a body that they couldn't as easily notice from the ground. Tall grass and weeds are cut down, clearing large sections of land to make searching easier and also to reveal any areas which may show disturbed earth or anything suspicious, though at this point, three and a half years of overgrowth have likely concealed the terrain. Sadly, they are unable to find anything of significance at this time. There will be another search, conducted in April of 2011, and this one consists mostly of volunteers, friends, and family. Present at this search are Janet Forte, Detective Hoadley, Private Investigator Joe Carrillo, among others. But again, nothing is found. Hoadley also looks into the crack house in Coconut Grove, where Joe Carrillo felt Lily may have ended up. Unfortunately, with so much time having passed, there's nothing there which can produce any evidence or solidify any link to Lily. At this point, Hoadley's suspicions begin to turn towards Christian, and he feels that Lily likely wouldn't have made it to the crack house. He doesn't believe the story about Lily walking out, and he has a lot of questions which only one man can answer, and that man is Christian himself. In March of 2011, nearly four years after Lily vanished, Christian arrives in Hoadley's office for an interview. Hoadley directly tells Christian that he simply doesn't believe his story and that it doesn't make any sense. They run through the events of that night multiple times, and Christian's story stays fairly consistent. When he mentions to Hoadley that he felt Lily may be suicidal, he tells the story about her allegedly attempting to hang herself in the closet. This time, he can't seem to keep the details straight about the method by which Lily supposedly attempted to hang herself. Of this discrepancy, Hoadley says, quote, At one point, he says it was a tie. At another point, he says it was a bungee cord. He can't remember which to say. End quote. Hoadley simply didn't believe Christian's account of things, and he has been vocal about the fact that he believes the story about Lily's attempted suicide is made up. At this point in the interview, he asks Christian if he would be willing to take a second polygraph test. Christian agrees, but again, when asked if he knows what happened to Lily, his answer shows deception. He fails the second polygraph, solidifying him in Hoadley's mind as a person of interest. In response to failing the second test, Christian said, quote, Hoadley says I failed this other one. I don't know. I don't see how. It's like the nerves, nervousness, whatever it could be. This whole situation eats me. End quote. Then, there is the question of the disappearing SUV. At the time of Lily's disappearance, among other vehicles, Christian was driving a 2005 black Cadillac Escalade. According to Christian, shortly after Lily's disappearance, he totaled the SUV when he fell asleep behind the wheel on a long drive home from a family funeral. However, in a memo which has been publicly released, it has been pointed out that Christian never filed an insurance claim in regard to the SUV, there is no official accident report, and the whereabouts of the SUV itself remain unknown. Unfortunately, despite these glaring details, there's nothing solid to connect Christian to a crime being committed. By this point in time, for both Janet and Lucelli, the hope that Lily will be recovered alive has completely faded. They believe, firmly, that Christian knows more about the situation than he has shared, 
and they speculate that he may have been involved in a crime which led to her disappearance. In an interview, Janet stated, quote, We need to find her. Her family needs some sort of resolution. I can't imagine her son growing up, not knowing what happened to his mother, and thinking that she abandoned him or something like that. End quote. Christian is adamant that he had nothing to do with Lily's disappearance. He would later say, quote, If I had something to do with her disappearance, why would I force the police to take a missing persons report when I could have let that go? I had nothing to do with Lily's disappearance. There is nothing that I knew more than her leaving my apartment, and there is nothing I know. There is nobody I have spoken with. There is nobody I have talked to that has any idea, along with myself, about what happened to Lily that night after she left." End quote. Sadly, the information about the investigation, about Lily's disappearance, about everything, begins to taper off. There was another sighting reported. The manager of Camilla's house claimed to have seen Lily in a homeless shelter in downtown Miami. Police were dispatched but unable to locate Lily. Lucelli put up flyers at the shelter, though she feels it was a false sighting, having received no calls after putting up the flyers. Miami-Dade Captain Bollinger Heller, when asked about the possibility of foul play, responded, quote, We haven't ruled out anything, but at this point, we have no proof of criminal wrongdoing in this case, so we can't just pick someone up and arrest them. End quote. Detective Hoadley retired, and the case moved on to Sergeant Gallagher. Gallagher later retired, and in 2016, the case fell into the hands of Detective Juan Segovia. As far as is known, the case is still active, and Segovia is pursuing all leads. Sadly, Lily's case has been fairly absent in the media, getting only minor coverage in a few newspaper articles and across a few online blogs, though the television series Disappeared did do an episode on her case. For whatever reason, this sad and tragic story has been pushed aside, and while the debate about why is endless, the one thing that is known for sure is that a beautiful, loving young mother has disappeared and remained absent for more than 11 years. Several theories have been put forward in regard to what may have happened to Lily, some by Janet and Lucelli, some by Detective Hoadley, and some by Christian himself. The first theory is that, as Christian alleges, Lily Aramburo walked out of the condo at 2 a.m., wearing only a nightgown, carrying bungee cords, and was simply never seen again. Whether Lily elected to walk away from everything and everyone she ever knew while abandoning her son remains hotly debated. The second theory follows along the lines of the first, though in this situation, it's been theorized predominantly again by Christian that Lily left the condo that night not to run away, not to get high, but to commit suicide due to the state of her life, her addiction, and her son being removed from her custody. The third theory is that Lily may have left of her own volition and gone back to the crack house located in Coconut Grove, where she may have been victimized by any number of unsavory individuals living there and possibly murdered. The fourth and final theory is that Lily did not leave the condo by her own choice that night. For many, including Lily's own family, and Detective Hoadley, they believe that Christian knows exactly what became of Lily and that she was likely the victim of a violent crime. Others suspect that Kelly may know more than she is told and have speculated that she may have been involved in either the commission or covering up of a crime. Lily Aramburo disappeared nearly 11 years ago. Over the course of those years, her mother and best friend have never stopped talking about her fighting for justice, struggling to get the authorities and the media to give the attention due to her case. Janet Forte manages a Twitter account, which utilizes the hashtag JusticeForLily, 
as well as the blog justiceinmiami.org. She continues fighting for her best friend and has done multiple interviews with online bloggers and was also kind enough to speak to me during my preparation for this episode. I asked Janet to describe Lily to me in her own words. Her response was, quote, She'd tell lots of stories. Her hair was long and just beautiful. I loved braiding her hair. She was a skinny, mini little thing, and the moment we met, we just clicked. She and I hit it off. She was quirky and witty and had a sarcastic sense of humor. We used to sit and watch Comedy Central shows like Reno 911 and Crank Yankers. She loved it. We had fun together, just hanging out. There was something about her I just can't put into words. Her energy, I don't know. I guess I'd say we were like soul sisters, which made her special to me and unforgettable. And I am not the only one who describes Lily that way. End quote. Christian has had his difficulties in the years since Lily vanished. He has faced multiple arrests on drug charges, trespassing, resisting arrest with violence, and driving without a valid license. He claims to be sober today, and while he says he wishes he knew what happened to Lily, interviews conducted with him in later years show the wear and tear of a man who has been, for many, the one and only suspect. In an interview, Christian was quoted as saying, quote, It burns me up that they keep coming back to us. We had nothing to do with her missing. She walked out of my apartment on her own merit. She left. End quote. Lily's son, Paulden, will turn 12 this year, having no true memory of his mother outside of what he is told and family photographs. He has grown up never having the answers, and in the meantime, Lucelli has raised her grandson, telling him that Lily is in heaven, but every day is still hard to face. She hasn't seen her daughter since 2007, and she had to grapple with the difficult reality that she may never see her again. When last seen, Lucelli Lily Aramburo was described as being a Hispanic female with brown hair and brown or hazel eyes. She stands approximately 4 foot 11 to 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighs approximately 100 to 110 pounds. Lily has a scar on her left hand, a scar below her left knee, a cesarean section scar on her lower abdomen, freckles on her shoulders and face. She has musical notes tattooed on her back. Both ears are pierced and she has previously broken her right wrist and her back. In Lily's absence, her mother has had to move on with her life, doing the best she can for herself and her grandson. While the loss is a pain that's impossible to describe, Lucelli does have the gift of her grandson, to whom she credits so much of her drive and determination. When asked how she does it, Lucelli answered, quote, I kept moving forward because I have a tremendous gift, a tremendous blessing, which is Lily's son, which he happens to look identical and is just another chance for me to give my love to my daughter, to him, to learn from all these things. I still believe something is going to happen. I have to. I have to believe I'm going to find out what happened to my daughter. Need to go back to school, but can't find the time with your busy schedule? Florida International University has 20 years of excellence in online education. FIU is Miami's largest university, with nearly 54,000 students, 1,100 full-time faculty, and more than 200,000 alumni. FIU online students can take advantage of high-impact opportunities that lead to success and leadership skills. FIU's online programs feature the same top-ranked faculty as on-campus classes. For more information, please visit their website at 
www.fiuonline.com slash podcast. That's fiuonline.com slash podcast. The disappearance of Lily Aramburo is a terribly tragic story. A young mother, struggling with addiction issues, simply vanished into the night, and the more one looks at the case, the less sense it makes. Her mother has never stopped searching for her, and her best friend has devoted a great deal of time and effort to trying to locate Lily, as well as attempting to keep her name alive in the total absence of media interest, or apparently, police interest for quite a while. It's exceedingly frustrating attempting to research this case because of a total lack of available information. There are very few news articles, most of which come up short on facts. A Google search for Lily finds her name spelled in several different ways, with most writers not even interested enough to get the spelling correct. Even her official police-made missing persons flyer spells her name incorrectly. Sadly, this is not an uncommon story. A person goes missing, and if the media doesn't see dollar signs in the story, they don't take it. I've discussed the phenomena of missing white woman syndrome before, and this case certainly seems to be one which defines it more clearly. Lily was a Hispanic woman from a lower class background and had a history of drug abuse, and for many in the media, that's enough to dismiss her story as unnewsworthy. While the media has the right to report, or not report, any story they desire, the questions really become difficult to answer when one examines the initial investigation of the Miami-Dade police. Yes, I know they're overworked, understaffed, and working in an overwhelming case list, but that doesn't justify essentially putting this file on the back burner, does it? Anyone who looks at missing persons cases knows how incredibly crucial those first few days and hours are. And in this case, those opportunities to get a jump start were simply thrown by the wayside. In the years since, while they've been publicly outspoken about their dedication to the case, in private, I've seen evidence which would tell a very different story. With the exception of Detective Hoadley, there's been no law enforcement official who has truly given his or her all to this case, and much of the details have been allowed to fall through the cracks. Even private investigator Joe Carrillo, working pro bono, dedicated more time and energy to Lily than the officers originally assigned. It's a very sad turn of events, and in a case where the answers may all be available beneath the surface, the digging investigative skills necessary were simply not applied, or they were applied too late. Before moving into the theories, I wanted to address two things. Firstly, Janet Forte. Though I typically don't reach out to anyone associated with the case until after I've written the episode, in an attempt to clear myself of any bias, or by being swallowed into too much speculation, I did find it necessary to reach out to Janet. This case has so little information available that I wanted to ensure I was able to get what was necessary to tell this story and to tell Lily's story in its full context. I want to thank Janet for her openness with me and for her willingness to discuss this very painful part of her life. I asked Janet for verification of several pieces of information, and I asked for information about Lily as well as the state of the investigation. She was very forthcoming, open, and honest, and I greatly appreciate her candor and her directness. Secondly, I wanted to address Lily's known drug addiction. I understand the stigma that goes along with addiction, and how for many, it's very easy to dismiss someone who had a drug problem. This seems to be a state of mind that permeates many aspects of society, including but not limited to the media and investigators. I've known several people throughout my life who have struggled with addiction. There are so many misconceptions about addicts, many of whom want to get out from under the crushing control of their drugs, but simply don't have the ability, the willpower, or the assistance necessary to do it. 
I can't change your mind about this subject, but I do ask for a level of understanding and compassion, at a minimum. Lily was suffering from multiple forms of mental illness while simultaneously battling her addiction issues, and while she was able to get clean during her pregnancy, she wasn't able to maintain it much beyond that. Be that due to the influence of others or her own temptations, we can't know for sure. But it's my belief that no one, whether alive, deceased, missing, or found, should ever be dismissed entirely and considered less worthy of time, attention, or focus from a police department due to addiction issues. Lily was a daughter, a mother, and a friend. She had her demons, and ultimately, they may have contributed to her disappearance, but that doesn't make her disposable nor undeserving of justice. The first theory in this case examines the possibility that the initial reports of Lily's disappearance could be correct, and that she, wearing only a nightgown, elected to walk out of the condo at 2 a.m., carrying bungee cords, and mysteriously vanish into the night. There are a lot of factors when it comes to this theory. First, we have to consider the source, which is Christian Pacheco himself, again no relation, the man many consider to be the prime and most likely suspect in this case. This doesn't go very far to speak to his credibility. The possibility has to be considered either way. We don't know exactly what Lily's state of mind may have been at this time. We know from a previous visit from police that Lily spoke about struggling with mental health issues and made the statement that her medications weren't working. Lily was known to suffer from schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, and anxiety. Taking these into consideration, Lily's mental state that night may not have been the best. If you factor in drug use which took place, we may have no way of really getting inside of her head. Christian has said that Lily became angry with him that night over their mutual friend Kelly, who she accused him of having romantic interest in. If Lily was high, struggling with her mental illnesses and feeling angry on top of that, she could have been likely to storm out as she is alleged to have done. Of course, there are details about this which don't make any sense. Why would Lily have taken nothing with her other than allegedly bungee cords, leaving behind her money, phone, clothes, and even her shoes? It doesn't make a great deal of sense. Now, if someone is in a bad mental state and intoxicated on illicit drugs, their choices may not be the most logical. The question would then become where she was intending to go. Multiple people throughout her life have said that Lily would often go pick flowers when she felt sad, depressed, or frustrated. Even Christian said he thought perhaps that's what she was going to do. But it doesn't really make sense in the overall picture. One detail about the walking out theory, which makes a lot of people question it, is the fact that after walking out, Lily was never seen again. We're talking about a 23-year-old woman who had nothing besides her nightgown and the alleged bungee cords. How could she walk off, and if it was truly of her own volition, manage to stay hidden for all these years? Some have brought in the possibility that Lily may have been victim of a random act of violence, and this is certainly something that may have happened, but the idea of a woman walking the streets in a nightgown at 2 a.m. seems like it might draw some attention from people who may have remembered seeing her. It's been nearly 11 years since Lily vanished, and in that time, there has never been a single confirmed sighting of her. That's pretty hard to achieve if you're looking to disappear. If indeed she walked out, Unless she ran across someone looking to create a problem or commit a crime, it's highly unlikely that she would have stayed gone all these years, and in the hours and days after leaving, wouldn't have reached out to a friend or her mother for assistance. There simply isn't a lot to work with here. The idea that she walked out can't be ruled out, but in the grand scope of things, it certainly doesn't seem like it possesses the highest probability. Christian and Lily had a very back-and-forth relationship. Arguments and violence don't appear to be uncommon. So why would she walk out after what was allegedly a minor argument, 
and why wait for Christian to have gone to the bedroom to do so? It's also curious that Christian wouldn't have at least gone to the door and called her name or tried to convince her to come back in. But when you're dealing with a condo full of people who are getting high, it's hard to say what kind of behavior would fit into the definition of normal at that time. The bungee cords are an interesting factor, and for many, if Lily did indeed walk out with them, then suicide could be really the only possibility here, which leads us to our second theory, that Lily left the condo that night with the intention of taking her own life. The suicide theory is predicated by a few different details. Firstly, that Lily is said to have taken two bungee cords with her. Secondly, Christian's statement that she had attempted suicide previously, a story which no one in Lily's life had ever heard prior to that day. Thirdly, that Lily was suffering from mental health issues, and even her own mother, around that time, thought she may be exhibiting signs of postpartum depression. Fourthly, would be her drug addiction and the influence of those drugs on her thought process. And finally is the heartbreaking blow she suffered when her son was removed from her custody and she blew a chance to win him back by failing a drug test in rehab. All of these go towards state of mind, and it isn't hard to imagine that someone with this dangerous combination of circumstances may feel frustrated, overwhelmed, and in a moment of weakness, it all may have been made worse by an argument and the influence of drugs. Many have considered this a possibility that she may have made the choice to end her own life. It's impossible to rule this out when all factors are considered. Lily was clearly in a bad place. When her mother was asked about suicide, she was adamant that Lily would never have done that. She loved her son too much and wanted to get her life together for him. Most of Lily's friends felt she wasn't the suicidal type, but it's impossible to know what was going through her mind at that time. It isn't uncommon for people suffering from mental health issues, in combination with a crippling addiction, to take extremes in order to end their suffering. Some things do come into question, though, as neither Lily's mother nor Detective Hoadley believed Christian's story about the previous suicide attempt, and Christian himself seemed to have difficulty keeping the story straight. We also have to consider the alleged phone call, during which Lily is said to have claimed that she was in fear for her life from Christian. Would someone who was considering suicide as an option be expressing a genuine concern for her life 24 to 48 hours earlier? Perhaps but it certainly makes things more suspicious. The suicide theory becomes even more bizarre when you consider the fact that Lily was never found. Taking bungee cords would, in most cases, suggest the possibility of hanging or at least some form or fashion of self-inflicted strangulation. Most people who are not in the right mind and are in a dark enough place to consider suicide aren't going to go through a great deal of trouble to conceal the location of their body. If indeed Lily's plan was to go and commit suicide, why wasn't she ever found? It doesn't make a lot of sense, and it throws a lot of questions on the suicide possibility. Lily was walking, barefoot, at 2 a.m. The idea that she would have walked far enough away as to not be located is unlikely also. The village at Dadeland, where the condo was located, is in the middle of an urban area. The ocean was located approximately five miles to the east of the condo. The average walking speed of a person in decent health, not influenced by drugs or lacking appropriate footwear, is 17 to 20 minutes per mile, assuming the person is walking the average of 2.8 to 3.5 miles per hour. For argument's sake, Imagine Lily was able to cover a mile every 15 minutes. This would have her walking an hour and 15 minutes, during which time she would be passing through urban areas and was never sighted. While I believe suicide is a possibility that has to be considered, there's not enough information available to say for certain. The lack of a body makes it very hard to swallow suicide as an option. The third theory sticks with the idea of Lily leaving of her own volition, though it specifies a possible location she may have been heading. The crack house in Coconut Grove 
where she and Christian had previously scored drugs. Coconut Groves was a neighborhood located approximately 4.5 miles southwest of the condo, making it a shorter walk for Lily than had she gone towards the beach, but also still taking her somewhere around an hour if she weren't weighed down by drugs and a lack of shoes. Also, why would Lily bring the bungee cords with her? Hard to say. But for a time, there was a consideration that Lily may have gone towards this crack house location, either hoping to score more drugs, looking for a place to crash, or for some unknown reason. Private investigator Joe Carrillo felt there was a great possibility that Lily had ended up at this location and had been murdered. There was allegedly a tip given that Lily had been murdered by three individuals, including a man who had previously been convicted of second-degree murder. Though Carrillo passed this information on to the Miami-Dade police, nothing was ever done about it. In fact, the police visited the crack house and fairly quickly crossed it off their list of possibilities. Whether this was due to finding information which proved Lily had never been there, or simply out of a lack of information, we may never know. Regardless, the idea that Lily may have been the victim of a violent crime here certainly has to be considered. We have Christian's own description of the place, which makes it sound like every horrible thing you'd imagine a crack house to be, and then some. Christian has said he thought it was possible that Lily had gone there and that he checked for her, but again, almost all of his statements on this case have to be taken with a grain of salt. Let's face it. It's a sad reality, but people who are addicted to drugs are often assaulted and murdered by other drug addicts and dealers. When you bring drugs, paranoia, money, shady people and shady locations together, you've got a very dangerous situation. Had Lily made the walk to the crack house on the night she vanished, there's almost no end to the possibilities of what could have happened there. We know that at least one of the people who frequented the location was a murderer, so the idea that Lily could have become a victim certainly has to be considered. The problem is, again, as we've seen so much on this case, there's almost nothing to go on. We have an alleged report that Lily may have been murdered, but with no corroboration and no evidence. When Detective Hoadley went back to the location years later, he felt that so much time had passed that any physical evidence which could have once been present was no longer there. He was likely correct. Of course, everything about Lily going to the crack house that night is speculative. She wasn't a foolish person, and it seems more likely had she been looking for somewhere to spend the night or someone to give her a hand, she was more likely to reach out to a friend or her mother. We may never know the answer to the question of why she would have gone down there, unless, perhaps, she thought someone there was a friend she could trust. Again, we have to consider her mental state and the possibility that she wasn't thinking straight. While I consider the crack house angle an interesting possibility, there isn't much that can be done with it at this point in time. There was nothing to sweep for in terms of evidence. Detective Hoadley found nothing, and Joe Carrillo passed on the information to the police, who ultimately swept it aside, either because they ruled it out or because they simply didn't follow up properly. Ultimately, this is another possibility in a case where almost everything is possible. One interesting thing to consider about the first three theories is that they're all based around one detail, Christian's statement that Lily walked out of the condo that night of her own choice. That leads us to the final theory, that Lily did not leave the condo by her own choice, and that Christian, Kelly, EJ, or some combination of the three know what happened to Lily, and that she may have been the victim of a violent crime. This is a difficult theory to pursue, as it's full of speculation, contradictory statements, polygraph results, and it revolves around a lot of rumor as well as an examination of the actions of a group of people who were all using drugs, specifically crack, at the time. While Christian has done a few interviews and even appeared on the television show Disappeared, Kelly has been less outspoken, and EJ himself has been, predominantly, a mystery. 
Kelly did identify EJ as being a man named Emmanuel de Jesus, but whether or not authorities ever spoke to him is unknown. Kelly herself has said that police waited a very long time before they reached out to her for information also. Kelly was reportedly friends with Christian for a long time, and it was through her that Lily met him. Lily and Kelly had been friends since middle school and were using drugs and crashing in various places together at different points in their life. They lived in a car together for a period of time and ran in similar circles of friends. Kelly has been both positive and negative when speaking about Lily, seeming to show two sides to their friendship. On the one side, the two were close and trusted one another. On the other, when drugs were heavily involved, there were disputes and paranoia, much of which revolved around each's relationship with Christian. There appears to have been some jealousy there, with Christian having said that Lily accused him of wanting Kelly, and Kelly having posted on MySpace that the drugs made Lily paranoid about their close friendship. Interestingly, Kelly speaks about Lily being a so-called crackhead, while she herself was allegedly indulging in the same drug activities with the same people. There really isn't much known about EJ other than he hung around with the group. It's been stated that EJ was present in the living room of the condo with Lily when Christian went to the bedroom to speak to Kelly, at which point Lily allegedly walked out. I've read it both ways with Christian saying he saw Lily exit the condo with the bungee cords as he returned to the living room, as well as Christian saying it was EJ who told him that Lily had walked out, and then he later noticed the bungee cords she was holding at the time were missing too. Regardless, the three shared a similar story, that Lily had walked out and they had no idea where she had gone. Christian speculated she may have gone to the crack house, Kelly said that was the only place she could think that Lily may have gone. What EJ had to say remains unknown, but had he contradicted their stories, it would likely have appeared somewhere in relation to this case by now. Kelly has said in interviews that Christian becomes violent when he's on drugs, and that, on at least one occasion, she had to pull Christian off of Lily when he lunged at her during an argument. Here's an important detail to consider. Christian was making good money at the time. He had multiple vehicles, two residences, and was a co founder of a non profit organization. It isn't hard to imagine that Christian was likely considered by his drug addicted friends to be a good supply. And in many of these cases, these people don't want to get on the bad side of the person who's helping them get their fix. It may all be speculative at this point, but were it true, this could have colored accounts of that night. You also have to factor in Kelly's possible relations with Christian, with whom she continued to hang around long after Lily vanished. Not long after Lily vanished, Christian alleges that his grandmother passed away, and he totaled his 2005 black Cadillac Escalade SUV when he fell asleep at the wheel. Over the years, Christian has been somewhat evasive in talking about this incident, and no one has yet produced a police report or insurance claim proving that this is what happened to the vehicle. For many, this raises questions about why, so soon after Lily vanished, his primary vehicle would have gone missing. Whether or not it may have contained forensic evidence suggesting a crime had been committed remains unknown. Others look at Christian suspiciously simply because of how long he waited to file a missing persons report, and then additionally, how long he waited before notifying Lily's mother. He did say he assumed someone else had told her, but considering the gravity of the situation, it would have made more sense to double-check that. Friends of Christians, Elvis and Dario, later told Lily's mother that they had seen her in Miami after her disappearance. This changed the shape of the search somewhat, as if someone has been seen after a disappearance, it opens up more options. However, when Detective Hoadley spoke to the men, both alleged they had never seen her, and Elvis went further, claiming that Christian offered drugs in exchange for making up the story. Christian denies this, and it's hard to know who's telling the truth here, but Elvis and Dario do appear to have less of a reason to lie about it, they had no dog in that fight, 
and it seems unlikely that they'd have made up the sighting out of nowhere. Again, we can't know for sure. Christian told investigators that Lily had attempted suicide previously and that he'd saved her life. According to this story, she had hung herself from a bar in the closet and he'd broken the bar down. Strangely, the details about this alleged attempt changed over time, with Lily in one account hanging herself with a tie and in another using a bungee cord. One might be able to chalk this up to confusion, the passage of time, and the involvement of drugs, but Detective Hoadley felt the entire story was made up in order to give strength to the possibility that Lily may have left on her own and to put her into consideration to have not been in the right state of mind. From everything I've looked into, I have found no evidence that Christian ever took part in any efforts of Lily's mother and Janet to have raised awareness of this case, nor did he participate in volunteer searches for her. While Christian alleges that he was spiraling out of control into drugs over his depression about Lily's disappearance, others have argued that he wanted to distance himself from the investigation. Both Janet and Lucelli found him evasive in his answers when he spoke to them, and Lucelli is on record as stating that in all the years since Lily vanished, Christian has never reached out to her to see how she is doing, nor has he asked about Paulden a child whom he at one time referred to as family. Then there are the two polygraph tests that Christian failed. While I'm not a huge proponent of the veracity of polygraph tests, they are often extremely unreliable and as a result are not admissible in court. It's interesting that he volunteered to take them in the first place and that the only points during the tests where he is believed to have shown deception is when he was asked if he knew what happened to Lily. Whether the failed polygraphs indicate guilt, hard to say, but they certainly raised suspicions that had been previously silenced when it was mistakenly reported that he had passed his first polygraph. I still don't understand how a police department can publicly state that someone passed a polygraph when they failed. It's yet another example of ways in which this case wasn't given the attention that it demanded and, frankly, deserved. Suffice it to say, you've got someone who was close with Lily, alleged to have been violent with her in the past. There was a rumored phone call in which Lily expressed fear for her life and suggested that Christian had claimed he could make her disappear. While much of this is hearsay or speculative, when considered in with all the other information, this doesn't paint a great picture for Christian. Somehow, despite all this information, all of these curious details, and the fact that the lover slash boyfriend slash fiance is often the first person police would consider a suspect, Christian wasn't officially questioned by police until nearly two years after Lily disappeared, which was also when he was given his first polygraph test. To say that this entire case is a travesty of justice is an understatement. Whether or not Christian played a role in Lily's disappearance, we simply don't know. Some have theorized that there may have been a violent crime committed. Others consider the possibility that Lily could have overdosed, and in their drug-induced haze, the decision was made to conceal her death. Neither of these can be ruled out. However, it seems more obvious and apparent that Lily's last night holds the answers and there's a good likelihood that someone in that condo knows more than they've said. This is an avenue which should have been looked into at the time, but which still could be examined. Perhaps, had it been looked at more closely back then, we wouldn't still be wondering today. One factor about Christian, which I can't help but find curious every time I read or listen to an interview with him, is the way he speaks about the condo that night. I've not yet seen a single quote from Christian where he ever refers to it as ours. He doesn't say Lily left our apartment or even the condo. He says she left my apartment. He doesn't say she left things at our house or at our place. He says she left everything at my house. Perhaps that's nothing more than arbitrary word choice, but I've always found it peculiar that they live together and yet he still refers to it all as his. 
Sure, he was probably paying the bills, but when someone lives with you, especially someone you claim to love and plan to marry, doesn't my home become our home? Purely my opinion, but I did want to call attention to it. We may never have the answers as to what happened to Lily that night. Whether she walked away, as Christian claims, or whether that was a not-so-elaborate cover story designed to throw off suspicion that just happened to work because of an investigation that was anything but devoted. When all of the theories are put side by side, it seems incredibly difficult to dismiss this final theory of being one of the more likely ones. At a minimum, it demands a greater level of investigation. Four people, high, spending the evening in a condo together. One goes missing, and the other three are never officially considered suspects, nor even thoroughly questioned until years after the report is filed. Anybody else have a problem with this? I spoke to a few friends in law enforcement during my investigation of this case, and when I spoke about this particular issue, I received words such as unprofessional, ridiculous, and pathetic. I find it hard to disagree with that. It's been nearly 11 years since Lily Aramburo vanished without a trace. Over the course of those years, her case has been subject to a very disjointed and unhelpful investigation. It was revitalized by a dedicated detective named Ray Hoadley, who has since retired, but has never given up hope that someday the answers will be found. Lily's friend, Janet Forte, continues to advocate for Lily on Twitter under the username Yogini, while maintaining the website justiceinmiami.org. She remains outspoken, takes part in interviews, and continually emails the Miami-Dade police about the need for further investigation, despite a resounding lack of responses that she's received over the years. Lily's mother, Lucelli, continues raising her grandson in hopes that someday she will find the answers as to what happened to her beloved daughter. Perhaps, someday, she will be able to tell her grandson about his mother and be able to end the story by telling him the truth was discovered and justice was served. Outside of a few articles written in local Florida newspapers, the broadcasts of a few Spanish-language news outlets, an episode of Disappeared, and a few online blogs, Lily's case is all but ignored. Perhaps that can change, and maybe someday we will all learn about what happened to the beautiful, sweet, and kind woman who gave birth to a son whom she loved more than anything, but never got to watch him grow up. Until further evidence is found, someone comes forward with new information, or there's a miraculous break in the case. The vanishing of Lily Aramburo remains open, unsolved, ice cold, and virtually ignored. Perhaps we can change that. I don't often ask, but if you've listened to this episode and this story has moved you the way it's moved me, share it and utilize the hashtag JusticeForLily. That's J U S T I C E, the number four, L I. L-Y. If you're interested in finding more information about the vanishing of Lily Aramburo, the resources are somewhat limited. A few local Florida newspapers covered the story. The television series Disappeared touched on the case. Janet Forte's website justiceinmiami.org has a good collection of notes and information. In addition to these resources, you can follow Janet on Twitter at Yogini. That's Y-O-G-I-N-I. As well as going to the Facebook page Help Find Lily Aramburo. Janet also asks that interested listeners follow on Twitter Missing underscore BC Crime Stoppers 305 and Missing Kids, and to be generous with your retweets, shares, and likes. If you have more information about the disappearance of Lily Aramburo, 
please contact the Miami-Dade police or the FBI. What do you believe happened to Lily? Tweet me at traceevpod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. If you'd like to support Trace Evidence, please visit the Patreon page located at patreon.com slash traceevidence. If you'd like to support Trace Evidence and don't want to join Patreon or make a donation through PayPal, you can look good and support the show at the same time. Visit traceevidence.threadless.com or click on the merchandise link on trace-evidence.com and get yourself a t-shirt, tank top, or an item of home decor to help show your love for Trace Evidence. I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Trace Evidence and invite you to check out our website at trace-evidence.com. You can find links to the Patreon, social media accounts, as well as places to go to download the podcast and subscribe. I'm always eager to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a good rating on iTunes and leave us a review. This will greatly help our reach and bring more attention to the cases I cover. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.